Roger Ebert called John Hughes the philosopher of adolescence. This title is exemplified in the 1985 film The Breakfast Club. Upon examination, The Breakfast Club is probably John Hughes' most intimate film. It takes place entirely in one location with five main characters and two supporting characters. This film had a major release, but if you were to release The Breakfast Club today, it would likely be more at home among the independents rather than major studio films. The film is 97 minutes of people just talking, minus a dance sequence and the scene where they run from the principal. It is for this reason that The Breakfast Club stands out among not just John Hughes films, but other films in general. You know the old saying, they don't make them like this anymore? Well, that's an apt statement concerning this film. There are no giant robots, no sparkly vampires, no superheroes, no movie stars really, no action sequences, just five high school students in detention. So why is this film considered a cult classic? The answer lies in its simplicity. The Breakfast Club begins with the introduction of five teen click archetypes. The jock, the princess, the basket case, the nerd, and the troublemaker. All forced to spend a Saturday in detention for various infractions. We become invested immediately in these characters because we think that we know them. Hell, we may have even been one of them in high school. Through this instant recognition, the audience is eased into a story that begins at surface level and ends with the exposure of each character's very heart. That is the genius of this film. We begin on their level, judging each book by its cover, and soon we realize we don't know these characters at all. This is a film that truly takes the audience on an emotional journey with the characters, not just as passive spectators. With each new conversation, story, and revelation, we are forced to re-examine who these characters really are, just as they begin to re-examine each other. The awakening of these characters shows us their humor, their fear, their anger, their intelligence, and dignity as they discuss everything from their crimes to their parents and friends. They go from being strangers to enemies to allies and back around again. In all honesty, I can't think of a recent mainstream Hollywood film, let alone one about teenagers, to show such range of emotion. In a pivotal scene, the students call each other out on their behavior towards each other, and it's Claire, played by Molly Ringwald, that speaks honestly about their situation. She says that come Monday morning, despite the friendships forged in detention, they will all go back to their respective cliques and no changes will be made. A harsh but likely statement. We as the audience want them to remain friends, but we also know that life doesn't come with Hollywood endings. As they delve deeper into who they are, these characters are also forced to examine relationships with the adults in their lives. The opening sequence in which the characters are dropped off for detention defines who our characters are in relation to their parents. Brian, played by Anthony Michael Hall, and Andrew, played by Emilio Estevez, both have pressure coming from home, one with regard to academics and the other with athletics. Claire's father glosses over the fact that she's done anything wrong and tells her he'll make it up to her. Allison's parents don't even have a conversation with her and Bender's parents are never seen. What could be taken for granted as a simple introduction to our characters gives us everything we need to know. It's only in the second act of the film that we watch the consequences of these relationships unfold to form new discoveries and tear down preconceived notions. The other two adult characters in the film serve different functions than the parents. Principal Richard Vernon is played as both a harsh disciplinarian and a buffoon. He serves to play particularly against Bender's tough guy character. However, in a quiet moment with Carl the janitor, we learn that he feels that the students have turned on it. Carl responds by saying, the kids haven't changed, Vern. You have. This scene not only shows the multiple dimensions of Vernon's character, but also proves that even adults have trouble getting their shit together. In this case, the adults are no better than the students. Allison puts it perfectly. When you get old, your heart dies. The character of Carl the janitor serves as the eyes and ears of this institution. He knows more about these characters than even they want to admit to themselves. Why? Because he was once one of them and now sees it from the other side. He serves to bring both the students and the principal back to reality when they feel like they're above it. Carl, oddly enough, is the one character who seems to have a better grasp of both adolescence and adulthood. He remembers what it's like to be a teenager and knows that life doesn't always turn out the way you want it to. Since this film is nothing but a series of conversations, it runs the risk of losing the audience. 
Okay for a stage play, not okay for a film, but John Hughes utilizes several dynamic shots to create pacing and mood. He also uses music to the same ends. This reinforces the dialogue by keeping it visually interesting and making both the emotional and lighthearted scenes stronger. This film is perfectly cast and these young actors deliver performances that are as varied as their characters. We see each character go through indifference, humor, anger, vulnerability, disappointment, and finally victory. The well-written dialogue, the dynamic shooting, and outstanding performances give The Breakfast Club solid pieces with which to build a perfectly orchestrated whole that is, well, different from John Hughes' previous works. Unlike Sixteen Candles, we don't get the heightened reality here. I mean, there are some moments, but they're few and far between. We are primarily treated to a very honest portrayal of the high school experience from every possible angle. We aren't given a certain ending or a grand romance like the birthday party with Jake Ryan. This is a film that has the guts to end on an uncertain note, although a note filled with hope. Will they ignore each other on Monday, forgetting the emotional journey that culminated in their friendship? I don't know. But I suppose that isn't the point of The Breakfast Club. In this case, it really is the journey. As the characters depart and we see Bender throw his fist up in victory, we are changed because, well, the characters have changed. In creating this review, I realized I could probably teach a class on The Breakfast Club alone. Because of this, I was forced to cut some sections out of the review in favor of length. If you're interested at all, I encourage you to check out the supplement blog found at www.cigaretteburnpictures.com and tune in next month for my tag team review of Pretty in Pink.